It feels like we have done everything in pro wrestling. I mean, we even had Mantar. Where else do you go when a half man, half bull has made their debut? Exactly. We here at What Culture, though, are basically sports entertainment detectives, so damn it, we've gone back in time and we've done the work. For I am Simon Miller, and please do hit that subscribe button. And yeah, this is 10 incredible wrestling firsts you didn't know about. Number 10, the first WWE match that wasn't booked by Vince McMahon. Now, obviously, Vince McMahon Sr. booked a lot of WWF matches, so we're talking about after his son took over, but you should put this in your notebook because this is when we got something different. And we're not worrying about NXT or house shows either as they fall under a very specific remit. And also, TV is what counts even to this day. Just how the chairman of the board sees things. Back in 1995, McMahon felt like his product needed a breath of fresh air, so he turned to to Bill Watts and gave him the power. If you don't know, Watts was a well-known figure who had found tremendous success with Jim Ross in the Mid-South promotion, so why not see if he could bring that magic to the World Wrestling Federation? So in September of that year, Vinnie Mac sat down with Bill and said he would have full autonomy to do what he wanted. Now that lasted about a week because as soon as McMahon found out Bill wanted to have The Undertaker, Shawn Michaels, and Diesel destroyed by a group of heels, he put the brakes on. We can't do this to our baby faces, pal. What is this old school nonsense? It's why Doc Hendricks magically appeared on TV to tell us the dead man was definitely going to be okay, but we digress. The point is, there was a roar around this time where we got Marty Jannetty versus Skip, which had nothing to do with Vince, this was all Watts. You can't really tell when you watch it, but man, did it have serious fallout. Watts was gone before he even began as McMahon took over once more, and I think ever since, he never let go of the reins again. Number nine, the first ladder match. So this gets argued about all the time, but there's no need. It's all there. Stampede Wrestling was among the front runners to introduce this to an American audience after Dan Crowfat convinced promoter Stu Hart that having a greedy heel use this stipulation to try and steal some cash would be great. So originally, it was pure storyline. This was way back in 1972 as Dan and Tor Kamata went to war, which is where Bret Hart got his inspiration from. He pitched this to McMahon as far back as 1992, and both both the AWA and World of Sport had mucked around with it in the 80s. It, of course, went off the rails eventually as the risk factor went through the roof, but that's evolution for you. Not only is it a mystery, but when you're trying to make a name for yourself, you can dive off a ladder and onto a fallen opponent. It often works, but just ask Edge, who agrees that he went too far, and it's likely a reason he had to retire when he did. And this is why, thank goodness, he was able to come back for a round two. Number eight, the first heel authority figure. So this was well overplayed before long. After the success of McMahon versus Stone Cold Steve Austin, WWE felt they must do this story over and over until the well had definitely been run dry. At least they realized eventually. In terms of major cable TV shows, though, it was Eric Bischoff in WCW who was channeling a version of what Ted DiBiase was doing so well when Vince basically followed suit. That's right. Easy e jumped on this almost as soon as the NWO became a thing. So McMahon did the same. If we go back to 1992, though, Vinny was toying with this as part of an agreement with Jerry Lawler to bring the king into the WWF. So, in return, McMahon sent wrestlers to the Memphis promotion to try and screw Lawler over we had come full circle. The clock goes back even further. As in 1985, Tom Renesto was the crooked promoter trying to get the better of Jerry, although he had a very familiar excuse. He was just trying to do what was best for the company, and Lawler didn't fit into that bracket. What does that sound like? I'm sure you can go back even further to find more things like this as wrestling has over relied on it throughout the decades. It just happened to peak in the late 90s, and all things considered, we shouldn't do this for another 10 years at least. It is cooked. Number seven, the first time we opened the forbidden door. Although we weren't calling it this back in 1992, it's very much a modern day moniker. You will recognize the name of someone who did head in this direction though, as it's none other than the late great Jerry Jarrett. Trying to tie down dates is hard, but it's definitely been a thing for a while, because you can even read about the international wrestling enterprise, New Japan and All Japan, when they too decided, oh hi, we could work together. NJPW founder Antonio Inoki was super savvy to this, as he knew to present these new roster members as invaders who would come to take over. Ricky Choshu would also do this in 1982 with his Revolution Army, and yep, it resulted in great business. Back on this side of the pond, however, Jerry and Angelo Poffo had rivaling Memphis territories in the ICW and CWA, who very much did not like each other, which is when Randy Savage flew in to take advantage. He turned up on the competition unannounced, which triggered some very real legal issues, until 1983 rolled around, and everybody realized to say competitive, they should work together. This led to Savage Savage doing it again, but with an agreement all around, and wouldn't you know it. By 1984, he and Jerry Lawler were doing massive numbers 
because everybody bought this as legit. And do you want to know what this proves? Wrestling hasn't changed at all. Number six, the first table break. Now we can debate this one forever. That sounds like a waste of time, so let's just try and figure it out. Kind of hilariously, we do have to once again go back to Memphis Wrestling that really did shape the modern product, because 10 years before Sabu was making tables his gimmick in ECW, Randy Savage and brother Lanny were feuding with the Rock and Roll Express. Trying to come across as right asshole, Savage hit an illegal pile driver through some wood. So shocking, people gasped. Compare that with today when we chant for more tables. I'm sure there will be other incidences from around the same time, but if you want to focus on one that truly set the industry off, I think it would be this one. Number five, the first finisher theft. So this happens all the time now. If you want to insult your opponent and add some spice to your match, hit somebody else's finisher. I mean, this has been the whole feud between Jade Cargill and Tyre Valkyrie in AEW. The Rock and Steve Austin definitely ran that into the ground because it was a spot they constantly returned to. And even CM Punk and Hangman Adam Page were doing this in 2022 as examples for days. Punk has actually likely done this better, especially when he tombstoned The Undertaker during their excellent WrestleMania match. Although it's Japan, where knowingly or not, this inspiration was born. Tatsubi Fujinami, who had an amazing feud with Ricky Choshu, nailed his rival with their own Scorpion Deathlock, as once again the fans reacted like this was a bank robbery. How dare he? The whole point was that Choshu was raging against the established New Japan order, and Fujinami in a great spot told him to flub off before he used his own move against him. So look at that, we're back again. Stories at the heart and center once more. Number four, the first five-star wrestling match. And no, look, you don't have to agree. Remember, all this stuff is subjective. You're allowed your own opinion. The irony is people get mad at Dave Meltzer for this, but he didn't even invent the thing. That was Norm Dooley and Jim Cornette, because they saw what the movie industry was doing, and they copied it. Given that it was Uncle Dave who revolutionized wrestling journalism in the 80s, this is his forever now. So in that sense, the first five stars came on the 21st of April 1983. The wrestling newsletter from then decided that Tiger Mask versus the Dynamite Kid was worthy, and gave it full marks. And yes, this makes sense. If you go and watch it today, you can see them moving the business forward to what we know today was always going to happen. There's always some confusion, though, because long after this, Meltzer thought on it and decided that a Ric Flair versus Butch Reed match from 1983 would also be given all of these stars. And this one is far harder to get if you are a new fan. It's very much of its time, but go and look for the selling and the crowd work. That really was second to none. They make you believe which is the point. Number three, the first This Is Awesome chant. But not the last. For this chant will be with us until after we are dead. It's a bit morbid, but it's true. As ever, there was a time when this meant more because fans would use it to underline that what we were seeing was next level. It just ties into life. It's a cool thing to shout. So soon it was just there for whatever. Which is fine, as long as you're having fun. One that stood out was when CM Punk took on Daniel Bryan at the Over the Limit 2012 pay-per-view. And the reason we bring this up is it may have been these two that were responsible for the original. For if we go back to 2005 and Full Impact Pro where they went at it, you shall hear fans shouting such words. Although the internet disputes this being number one, because you can then go back a year prior to 2004 and TNA's Victory Road show. There, Abyss and Raven kicked each other's ass, so when the masked man gets thrown through a table, you do hear this is awesome. It's not very nice to Abyss at all. It continues, though, because Lance Storm says he remembers it happening during his ECW days, which would have been the late 90s. Which brings us to the conclusion of... Who the flub knows? Number two, the first AEW match. The first match promoted by Tony Khan on an All Elite Wrestling show was the Casino Battle Royale at Double or Nothing 2019. What a day that was, and who knew the madness that was round the corner? It's been great. Thing is, in terms of an AEW sanctioned match that came before all of that, it happened here in England. Yep. How weird is that? Because as the promotion tried to come together, there were obstacles to overcome. This is always the way. But when Hangman vs. Pack, which was scheduled for the pay-per-view, fell through due to visa issues, everybody agreed we would still do it, but at the WrestleGate show in Nottingham. I mean, this was really cool, but man, it's so strange. I think it was mostly done to protect both guys, as Pack was also the Dragon Gate Dream Champion and couldn't lose. So he booted the ref on the balls and injured Paige, so everybody had got something they wanted to see. Plus, it was released on AEW's YouTube channels. 
So it's all right. If we are being super serious, though, yeah. This was the first All Elite Wrestling match. What an incredible way to start. Number one, the first wrestler to slam Andre the Giant. Because no, it wasn't Hulk Hogan. I know that's the WrestleMania 3 story, and as there was no internet, we got away with it. But still, it's not true. And that is not to take away from that match. It remains one of the most significant ever, with 78,000 people in the Silver Dome ready to watch it happen. But Andre got slammed all the time when he was younger and weighed a little bit less. I'm sure this happened way back in the 60s too, because why wouldn't it? And even Harley Race and Stan Hansen had done this when Andre was more the figure we remember today. So surprise, surprise, the Hogan angle was done for the narrative. Fair play though, that's not a bad thing. That's the entire point of wrestling. Know of any other incredible wrestling first that nobody knows about? Make sure you let us know in the comments below before you like the video, share the video, and subscribe. You can also click one of the videos on the screen to continue on your What Culture journey. Plus, we're on social media at Simon316 and What Culture WWE. And we have a website, WhatCulture.com. My name is Simon for What Culture. Thank you very much for joining me as always. And I look forward to talking to you very, very soon. Have a kiss.